a young woman in labor, Aishatu Badamasi, says a few prayers in the dusty town of Rushishi, northern Nigeria. George V, King of England, Emperor of India, has just finished a meeting with the Prime Minister, who was having a bad day in Westminster over the German attack on the Dodge ship, Kota Nupin Cargo. Arthur Richards, the Governor General, was sleeping on his breezy veranda overlooking the Lagos Marina, unaware that a future successor who would shape the fortunes of many of his 45 million subjects and their descendants was about to be born. Aishatu gave birth to a baby boy on August 17, 1941, and her husband named the child Ibrahim Maigari. General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida is the former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as well as the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. This administration attaches the greatest importance to constructive and helpful criticisms as well as the freedom of the press. And to declare further that the administration also attaches the greatest importance of fundamental human rights. In the life of Ibrahim Babangida, the amount of detail is huge, but the interest of the character does not fail. In the reaction to his retirement, it has intensified. He is someone about whom it's almost impossible to be neutral. People are fascinated, appalled, and delighted by him. Many think he saved Nigeria. Many, he destroyed it. The only thing that unites them is their interest. As he is passing from current controversy into history, his interest is on the mind. General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida is becoming a national archetype around whom arguments will forever swell. And because of his military background, his policies and beliefs and his character, he is a global archetype. He is a leader against whom all others are measured. For some, he is a cautionary tale, for others, a love star. As a first-class international acclaimed military leader, the mandate given to him on many occasions will perhaps forever be buried several fathom deep. But the linkages with the world have followed different trajectories and thereby hung some fascinating tales. He was there in the 60s when the first military coup that resulted in the killing 
of leaders from northern Nigeria took place on January 15, 1966. very tough and so in the front the motors all on a location and the bomb they are in shops that were falling on us and uh, fortunately for me it happened on the right I have it on the right so it saves my heart but it's pain it got into my lung it collapsed it for a short period of time up to the time i went to the hospital and that was what happened i was fortunate i was able to be evacuated on the same day just by providence and i got to lagos teaching hospital and one of my very luck was that I met a professor who is who is a Nigerian, a professor called Elebute in Lagos University Teaching Hospital. He he said I have two options. Either remove that sh shrapnel, but he believes it will stay for a long time. So it is still there now. It got in in nineteen sixty nine and is living very peacefully in, part of my lung, I have no problem about that one. This is what he said in 1969, I did my exercises and so on. But that's the situation. He was there in the mid 70s when some military officers led by Kone Buka Suka Dimka threw the country into darkness through the assassination of late General Ramat Mutala Mohammed. He was also there in the 80s and early 90s to lead the most populous country in Africa. General Babangida's experience is a good example of innovative diplomacy in a difficult terrain. And to declare further that the administration also attaches the greatest importance of fundamental human rights. He lives in a country built by genius and inventiveness. The secrets of his success and failures are to be found in his remarkable life. For the young ones and aspiring leaders to excel in their own life, there is a no better place to find inspiration than in the life of a man whose personal history is Nigeria's history and a man who has changed the country and changed lives. Seven to four kilometer west of Mina, capital of Niger State, lies Wushishi, headquarter of the local government that bears its name. It is a fairly developed local government headquarter with modern amenities. The roads in the inner section of the town are well laid out and town. They bear the names of important citizens. In the early part of the century, Wushishi was a small rural settlement said to have been founded by the Nupe, whose tea predominantly are there. Like a magnet, Wushishi attracted people from the western region and Hausa and Fulani from the northern Nigeria, and minority ethnic groups from almost every part of the country. The rainbow collection of big and small ethnic groups made Wushishi something of a cosmopolitan town in an interesting rural setting. Hundreds of early Igbo and Yoruba settlers chose to naturalize in Bushishi. Today, their descendants know no other home in the country but Bushishi. I was born just like any other child in a 
community that uh, is small. Virtually everybody knew every other person. No. But the population was very small at that time. And um, there are a lot of other settlers. We came there from another place and settled down there. And uh, I grew up just like any other child. Um, got to certain age, went to school, and then began to get mentored towards the future challenges that was ahead of us. So I grew up just like any other boy anywhere. In 1950, at age nine, as a young Ibrahim was enrolled at Native Authority Primary School, and this really had an impact on him. The first thing I can remember easily is I went to school in 1950. I was about age nine at that time. And uh, the whole world around me changed because I'm now facing another environment altogether and um, beginning to learn and get to know more about your own environment, about how the world is at that time. We went to primary school, then it was called Gwari and A, a native authority school. And from there, we spent four years in the primary school. And then, then we moved to what was called senior primary school in 1954. From there, we went to uh, uh, Bida Secondary School in 1957. So we, we grew up uh, as children, we may not playing around like any other kids that do. He lost his father in the early years, and while studying at the Native Authority Primary School, he lost his mother. Ibrahim lost his mother at a very uh, young age. And also, when we were in primary school, he lost his father. And uh, those days, you become your neighbor's uh, keeper. My old man happened to be somebody, a leader in our community. So he accepted Ibrahim as his own son. And that's how we, we grew up together. And this is, that's what kept us as a family. We are a family, uh, although of different uh, parents, but uh, we, we grew up together as a family. And uh, I'm happy to say up to today, not only between me and uh, Ibrahim, between our children, they, they, are, they are all together. So that's uh, what our parents have planted that is germinating into our, our relationship. The incident got him close to the family of another young man, Abdus Salam Abu Bakr, both of whom have remained close till date. Indeed, me and uh, General Ibrahim Bajamasi Babangida grew up in Mina. He's a year older than me, so we are in the same generation. And in actual fact, we went to school the same day uh, in 1950, when uh, my father, uh, whom IBB considers as an uncle and as a stepfather sent us to school. The young Ibrahim was very diligent in his education and was outstanding that he stood out among his peers. As we grew up, certainly, General IBB showed some uh, qualities of leadership. And what I uh, vividly remember while he, they were there is the fact that he was a head boy, even at that time, and a very good performer in the academics. 
because when we play in, in children, he always uh, appears to be the leader of the pack, and uh, we, we, we followed him in whatever games uh, boys do. In 1956, a reading competition was organized for the senior pupils, and Babangida and his friend Abdusalam Abubakar won it. At the prize was a princely sixpence. Each puppy received three pence. Their joy knew no bounds. I remember specifically during our uh, primary school days. At that time, in the early primary years, we are taught in vernacular. So we were taught in Hausa. I think in the third year, then you start learning English. I remember very well um, there was a reading competition in Hausa, and uh, myself and Babangida came first in that exercise. And I remember very well we were given three pence as, uh, our, as our prize, and that was a big deal. It became the story in the small village. Oh, these uh, young people have won prizes and were given uh, three pence. And of course, three pence was a big money at that time. So the, these are some of the issues that uh, really come to my mind that uh, I remember, besides some other escapades when we go, you know, hunting or when we go plucking mangoes and so on and so forth. Uh, well, just like uh, any village, uh, People growing up. The award was won in Babangida's final year in senior primary school. He had ended it in style. Bida is only 87 kilometers from here. Ibrahim Babangida had never been there, although he had heard so much about the town. In January 1957, Babangida and his friend Abdusalam Abubakar were put on the Baro Badegi train from Mina on their way to the provincial secondary school, Bida. It was the second time Babangida was leaving the familiar surrounding of Mina, his home. The first time was almost a year earlier in 1956 when he and Abu Bakr left Kaduna to represent their school during Queen Elizabeth's second visit to Nigeria. Babangida enrolled in the school as Ibrahim Badamasi. He only changed his surname to Babangida on his return from India after his commissioning into the Nigerian army as a second lieutenant. His school registration number was 211. He was 16 year old. One of his classmates was Sunny Bello, who also went into the army and retired with the rank of a colonel. Bello was the aide de camp to late General JTU Aguyi Ironsi. He was the smallest boy in the class, but he was the most outspoken and about the most rebellious. This is how to remember his encounter with Babangida. He, for a childhood, he had always been in the leading position. Uh, even in our school, as classmates, he was the head boy in our, in our school. And that's beginning, uh, that's a kind of uh, leadership potential. I believe the teacher then saw the potentials of leadership in him. That's why they appointed him as the head boy of the school. And therefore, he's, uh, he has been a great a leader. So I was really not surprised when he became a head of state because um, he had all the attributes of leadership. He was patient, he was intelligent, he was caring. And I think most importantly, he was very loyal to his, to his people, you know. He was loyal both to subordinates and uh, 
the superiors. So I think uh, he had been a very good rotation leader. He had, uh, his leadership traits. I've not been. I've not been surprised that he became a head of state in Nigeria. In 1956, he was enrolled in one of the renowned secondary schools in the prestigious Colonial Nigerian Government College, Bida. The school was very, very well established because we got the first black principal in 1903. And uh, that's remarkable because it's still colonial times, you know. So we have been very proud of that, that we had a principal at that period of... Uh, and this is the school that I found myself in. We, they have been very proud of that uh, achievement. While in the institution, the young Ibrahim was a shining light and through his popmanship and academic performances, his popularity soared in Mina and its environment. Because not only were we classmates in school, but also in the same house in the school. So literally, uh, every day of our school lives, you know, we're always together and we became very close friends. It was very nice. It was, uh, very generous, but very caring, and uh, extremely popular. So as uh, a growing up, uh, he was a role model student, he was quite good. He was a head boy, even at that time, and a very good performer in the academics. We had clubs, um, we had Boy Scouts, we had uh, young farmers and so on. And uh, I did a lot of sporting activities, soccer, cricket, and a little bit of hockey. He's still doing it. He came physically, addressed the student then, when he was the military head of state, a kind of inspirational speech so that they will be good boys and face their studies. Again, he assisted the school and that is why you have the fence around the school premises. You have seen the, the gigantic IBB library named after him. It was his, his handwork. Babangida left Bida in 1962 with glowing laurels. He won honors as headboard, as well as in academics, football, hockey, cricket, and athletics. Whatever his performances in class were, no one could take away from Babangida the fact that he remained in view of his teachers, one of the best boy the school ever had. In 1962, Nigeria was two years old as an independent nation. Many of the colonial administrators and professionals were still in government, helping the newly indigenized public service adjust to changes in the country's circumstances. The northern region was particularly short of trained indigenous manpower. The northerners had a crucial place and role to play in shaping the nation's identity. The Premier knew that the next few years would be crucial to the region. If he did not produce the required manpower, he must continue to depend either on expatriates or other regions. It was a new political game. In 1962, Sam Medubello visited the provincial secondary school Bida. The goal was to recruit young boys into the army with the aim 
that they will play roles on the stage in the unfolding national drama. During our time, there was a surge for getting younger generations, especially from the northern part of the country, to join the military. Just politics, again, to make a political balance and so on. So a lot of people came to us, uh, government officials, to talk to us to join the military. And we had uh, ministers at that time who toured the schools in the northern part of the country to get us to join the army. And quite a few of us in my class decided to give it a try. And we joined. We are classmates. And at the time we were living in secondary school, that was the time, you know, there is uh, the policy of Nigerianization of the officer corps and so on. In actual facts, we attended the same selection board for the, for, for, the, for the army. At that time, at the Nigerian Military College, there are certain number of trainees that can be trained. So Babangida's group were ahead of us. So they were selected to go and start training with people like General Abacha, like Ted Mukuro, the others that I can, I can, I can remember. Then we were in the waiting list. The same influence that uh, drafted him into the army uh, or made him interested to become an army officer is the same drive that took me to the military. The entrance examination and the interview were conducted in Kaduna on July 3rd, 1962. Late September 1962, Babangida received a letter through their family post office boss in Mina. In the letter dated September 24th, the Assistant Adjutant General, Royal Nigeria Army, informed him that he had been successful in the entrance examination into the Nigerian Military Training College, Kaduna, and was directed to report at the Depot Royal Nigerian Army, Zaria, on Monday, October 15th, 1962. The resumption was later deferred to December 10th, 1962, and on December 8th, 1962, Ibrahim Babangida took one final look at his school and walked out into the uncertainties of the larger world to begin a journey that would put the name of the young Babangida in the history book of Nigeria forever. On May 21, 1993, nearly 31 years later, he would return to the school in pomp and glory as president. The timid, lonely orphan paid homage to his roots where it all began for the last time. Uh, General Ibrahim Babangida is an old boy of this school. Uh, while he was serving as the Nigerian head of state, he decided to look back at the alma mater uh, to do one or two things uh, because that was the starting point of old boy association of Goma College Bida. They call it Bida Old Student Association, that is BOSA. When he came, one of my predecessors, the principal then, Babangila gave the directive that chunk cows should be given to students to slaughter to eat. And that is the the bedrock or the foundation of livestock in Gumbang College. Though later Absalom did the same thing too, he came with some. So Babangida has been the rearing point of the old boys because when he started this, others came around. And he has been of help. Even after his retirement, anytime there is a problem that needs his attention, assistance, the old boys will go to him and he give full support. In 1963, India offered eight places to Nigeria in the Indian Military Academy and Babangida was among those selected. 
but Bangida remembers his experience at the military academy. When we went to Indian Military Academy, they just finished a war with Chinese, with Chinese in India. All the training was very, very tough. Um, we started with over 2,000, but hardly 300 passed. So it was tough, both mentally and physically. If you are not physically tough, we will never make it in India at that time. This is one of the experiences we got was to be trained to remain tough. From the safe distance of his classroom in India, Babangida saw a nation at war and what war entailed. He did not have a field experience, but it took him only a few months for him to face the grim realities of war back home. At the eve of 1966, the shadow of Nigeria's political crisis had begun to lengthen. Drawing the new nation inexorably under it, in desperation, the political leadership had perhaps inadvertently involved the military in the resolution to suppress the mayhem and restore some sanity to the troubled spot in the Federation. It is debatable if the decision of the political leadership influenced by the thinking of the five young major who planned and executed the overthrow of the Balewa administration in January 15, 1966, but the involvement of the military in the resolution of the bloody civil crisis bound to give, and it did. The politics became the politics of tribe, maybe in certain states, even a little bit of religion in this. But the tribe seems to give the impetus in the political movement. And uh, we did quite a number of things that I think personally put an end to this internal cohesion that we have. And we don't seem to be, to learn from them. Even today, people are still talking about um, nationality, ethnic nationality, this and so on, which unfortunately I think is bad. At 3 a.m. January 15, 1966, Lieutenant Ibrahim Babangida returned from Cockrolly to his bachelor pad on Kanta Road, Kaduna. He did not have to wait for sleep. It came almost immediately. He hit the bed. At about 4.30 to 5 a.m., there was a repeated banging on his door. Babangida explains the situation thus. Living in work roads at that time, and uh, I had a friend by name Christopher Ubuque. We were we shared the same flat, we were bachelor officer quarters at that time. Uh, I came back, I was a young officer. We do a lot of night outing and going to parties and so on. So I came back late and then about one hour I had the knock on my door. He calls me Ibrahim. He said, Ibrahim, wake up. I said, Christopher, why are you disturbing me at this time of the day? He said, no, come out, there is trouble. So I did. And I came out. He said, there is trouble go and get dressed, we go back to our unit. So I quickly joined, went and changed. He was waiting for me, joined the vehicle that was to take us to our unit. And then as we moved towards our unit on the road, I knew something was wrong because our road, the road 
takes us through Amadou Bello, the premier's lodge. We passed, as we approached there, the whole place was on fire. And uh, we talked a little with my friend Christopher. He said this house was, uh, there was trouble in the country because it looks to him there was a coup d'etat. So we went, got to our unit at that time, the Reiki squadron. And our commander then was late General Hassan Usman Kassina. And he collected us to talk to us, to brief us about what was happening at that time. And uh, I remembered one phrase he used. He walked, he, he was a very studious person. He studied a lot. So he was just walking on the, just like we are sitting here in the corridor. So he said, he pities this country because what happened is bad. One of his finest phrases was, a coup succeeds coup. So at that time, we, I knew, I understood what he was trying to put across to us, that maybe this is the beginning of problem for this country. And behold, it was, very prophetic, what he said came out to be true. On July 29, 1966, there was a counter coup and the young Ibrahim actively participated in it. 200 days after, Aguye Ronsi assumed office as Nigeria's first military dictator. He was dead. The coup that brought him to power had given birth to the country's second coup. For three days, Nigeria had no government, but on August 1st, 1966, 30-year-old Yakubu Gowon became the new head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces. In the words of Mr. Sika, the rebel leaders ought to know when enough is enough. The agony of waiting for a new leader was over. They should call a halt to the shameless deception of innocent Igbos with reports of fictitious victories on the battlefronts. And a new chapter in Nigeria political crisis opened. I will say that it was the general feeling at that time that the coup was one-sided. Most of the actors, participants, were from a particular part of the country. Even that could not be 100% true. But the majority, the planner, for example, is from Midwest, as we called it at that time. Uh, this, the people from Midwest, Asaba area, and so on and so forth. So, there was a, what, a, a, the feeling that is one-sided, so it's not right. So people were sort of made to be agitated for a revenge. And that was happened. It permeated through the military, those same feelings. That made it easier to stage a coup against Iran. During the civil war, married man began to rule around my heart. So I said, uh, I think I will take a wife. Because when I was shot, I thought I could have been dead. And that's the end of it. So I decided to make it quick. It, I also saw General Gowan's wedding when I was in the hospital. And that also encouraged me to quickly get married and live like a normal human being. Ibrahim had met the young Maryam in 1964. I first met her sometimes in about 1964 or 65, 
But I knew her simply because I was related socially with her uncle. Her uncle, his son, is also my classmate. So I got to know she was living with her uncle at that time. A man called Muhammad King. And uh, my, his son, who is my colleague, is a retired Major General, Garba Dubai. And this is how we met. He also talks about the virtues that endeared young Miriam to his heart. Somebody, she is a very patient person and can easily tolerate a fellow human being. She can understand the weaknesses of human relations. And uh, that was what impressed me about her. After the war, he was at the Nigerian Defense Academy and he described his experience thus. The experience is good in the sense that all we are doing is to impart knowledge onto a younger generation of people who are coming, especially the military. And we trained people to believe in the country and to be prepared to fight for the country. So our training is mostly all, if you take them all together, you find we concentrate more on leadership. He was my company commander, Ashanti Company. SS3, which is short service for sale. And by appointment, I was the cadet sergeant. And he was my company commander. He was then a major. And being a company sergeant, that is an appointment given to leadership in the course. It's more or less like when you are in secondary school and you have a prefect. So when, once you are a prefect, you have a link with either the tutor or with the principal. So as a sergeant, cadet sergeant, I had a link with him. At all levels, troop, platoon, company, battalion, and so on and so forth. So all we are putting into people is the whole concept of leadership. That's number one. Number two, the concept of country. Country first before every other thing. When I first got into Nigerian Defense Academy as a cadet, and uh, I do, I, the encounter is like kind of uh, incidental because we normally the junior cadets, the new cadets are put you. Puti is a kind of uh, exercise that the senior cadets put the junior ones through, the new cadets through. So it was one of these afternoons we were out on Puti and then he was a major then and then the company commander of Ashanti Company was coming from his company, Ashanti Company, towards Boma. And I think it was between Abyssinia and Boma Company frontage that he met us with the senior cadet putting us and the senior cadet said, stand still. Then we all uh, stop what we are doing and he looked at us and smiled and I smiled back. Then the cadet now said clown because we are not allowed to be called cadet at that stage. He said clown. Why are you smiling at the senior officer? The senior officer smiled at me. So I, I returned the smile despite the toughness of, of the exercise we were doing, I was still smiling, and that's marvelous in my belief. And then subsequently, within that January 72 to March, before he left, our path crossed again with some of my 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 instructors. And uh, that also went very well. We were able to impart those into you find. You can hardly find any soldier today who will tell you that he preferred secession of the country or he preferred somebody that infringes on the unity of the country. These are all what we prepared the minds 
of the younger generation. Uh, training in NDA, that was uh, 1975. I was posted directly to Amon headquarters when uh, Bawangida then, Kanula Bawangida was the commander of Amon Co. and uh, Santa. So I was privileged to go there, and get to pay my compliments and also, you know, know him and uh, see him. I've been hearing of him uh, before then. I was just hearing about him. But physically, that time I was able to meet him on one one after my training uh, in NDA, 1973-1975. Well, I'm proud to say that some of the best and the brightest officers in the Nigerian army came from that corps. We had a lot of very prominent army officers who served the army very well, and a lot of them also served the country in different capacities like governors, ministers, and so on and so forth. After nearly nine years in power, some sort of disenchantment with the Gowon administration had set in. Agitation and corruption and ineptitude against him and the state governors were reefed. In 1975, IBB was part of the soldiers who decided to overthrow the government of General Yakubu Gowon. Gowon received the news of his oster in faraway Kampala, Uganda, where he was attending to summits of heads of state and government of state organization for African unity, OAU. His immediate reaction was a cool, almost detached acceptance of fate. The torch was seized from Gowon and given to Mutala Mohammed. Nigerians have shed much blood. The thought of further bloodshed, for whatever reasons, must, I'm sure, be revolting to our people. Where Gowon was slow, Mutala Mohammed was fast. Where he was decisive or vacillating, Mohammed was decisive. I've no resonated the popular head of state. As the morning event began to unfold much later, Babangida came to realize that he had escaped ambushed on his way to office that morning. I was commanding it at that time. And we had a very tough and brilliant uh, chief of army staff called T. White and Juma. When the who was announced by Dimka himself, we were having a conference. That conference, I was heading it as a colonel. So it's a period I brief senior officers, middle class officers about the reorganization of that. Because you remember, we're just out of a war from 10,000 to about 250,000 strong uh, army. I was in charge of it. And uh, so T.Y. Denjum was there with all his staff. We were doing a briefing about the reorganization of the army. I never knew that there was such a thing, but I was coming to the army headquarters. Everybody was looking for me. And then suddenly I appeared. I thought I was late, but I wasn't. So I was happy that I, when I got to T.Y. Njuma's office, he told me that, did you hear that there is a coup? I said, no, where? Because there was announcements, m music, and so on. What I later found out was very revealing. I was supposed to be killed or captured on that particular day because of my formation where I was commanding or the people staging the coup considered me and my troops fairly dangerous. They shouldn't allow us to have access because we can make trouble for them. Uh, I was coming out of my house. Normally I had a tradition. Once my car 
When I see my driver indicating where he wants to go, I have a tradition of asking him to change direction. So getting out of my house, he indicated right. I said, no, go left. We will arrive at the same objective, but preferring this road. But I gave him the option to choose any of the roads. But at the gate, I will tell him the last word. And I went left. That saved me. That saved my life. Because those waiting for me were on the right. I wasn't informed. It's just God. The coup was quashed. The government was saved. But Mutala Muhammad was dead. Babangida became the hero in that brief bloody drama. As far as the Nigerian public was concerned, everyone has played a supporting role to Babangida in it. He was the victor. On March 1st, 1983, Babangida, Buhari, Vatsa, and several others were promoted major generals. While some regarded this promotion as an attempt to persuade them from toppling the Shagari administration, suspicion about Babangida's ambition was still strong. By this time, Rumors of an impending return of the military were widespread in the country. Almost everyone could hear the clock ticking, taking the Second Republic towards its date with history. Finally, in the early hours of January 1st, 1984, Shagari's administration was toppled and Babangida actively participated in the coup. Again, somebody with different uh, perception now can see it differently. Who deters was the in thing at that time. So you have to justify it. And I think it was justified insecurity, corruption in the country. And this is what all our training is all about, about the security of the country, about corruption and so on and so forth. A coup only succeeds when ever there is a frustration in the society. So the society brought about the coup because the society was frustrated, it wasn't happy, it wasn't satisfied, and this make the environment very conducive for staging a coup d'etat. In the regime of General Mohammed Buhari, he became the chief of army staff. When he was the chief of army staff, indeed, his main focus is to ensure that the Nigerian army, the officers and men and women are treated fairly and they're given opportunity to, to excel in whatever field they decide to do in, in the military. I came under his tutelage to make me an officer. That's why I say he's my mentor. I was a cadet and he groomed me up as an officer. Up to today, I appreciate all his efforts and all the 64, I think we are about 10 or 11 remaining. The man Babangida eventually became the head of state in August 27, 1985. The cordial relationship he had maintained with both military and civilians through his years in the public service paid out for him. He had succeeded in constructing a vital bridge between the two worlds. He has not always directed the traffic on the bridge, but he has always taken more than a casual interest in the traffic on it. The civilians became the source of Babangida's political education 
which came in most usefully for him as events shot the military into the nation's political leadership. Military administration doesn't fit well with the rule of law. If, if they leave the rule of law on, then they cannot rule because they, go, they, they are precisive. The military is precisive. Look at the way states were created. If we have left the states to civilians, they won't do it. They will never see the light of the day. You know, IBB took decisive, uh, took decisive decision. And progressively moved the general towards the top of the political totem pole. Among the civilians who worked with him successfully are Olufalai and Kalu Idika Kalu. I first met uh, former president Ibrahim Babangida um, when he was still a pure military officer. Uh, I think it was soon after the attempted coup. I think it was the Oka coup, which he helped to foil. Uh, that was what brought him limelight, just as far as those of us in the civil service were concerned. And that was when I met him for the first time. He was appointed into the ruling council. That was where I saw him. My first impression was that he was a, a very quiet person, uh, deep and thoughtful. That was my first impression. I served under uh, General Buhari as a commissioner in Old Demo State. I met IBB in the course of uh, many meetings to the Council of State. My formal meeting with uh, IBB was um, be sometime in August of 85. And uh, I had uh, <clears throat> written a paper about all the reforms that we needed. You know, you know, previously I had a long stint. All these things are invariably interconnected. I worked at the World Bank. I worked on developing countries like Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, China. Naturally, uh, <clears throat> my field is economics and um, I had a very clear idea what we needed to be doing in order to turn around the Nigerian economy which was always uh, a contention for those who are coming into government, not to say making coup, <laughs> you know. So I wrote this paper and um, the idea was to send it on to Lagos through the chief of general staff, that is Commodore B2 Kiwe. And um, before I could even retrieve it as a commissioner of finance and planning in Old Imo State, I was told that uh, uh, emissary soldiers were in no worry to see me and I was uh, asked to come to Lagos. After a brief explanation by why, for why I was required in Lagos, Commodore Bituki ushered me into the presence of uh, General Babangida and I was asked to explain uh, what I thought we needed to do. And I went ahead and started discussing. And I was quite impressed that they were very prompt, straightforward to the, to the issues, uh, even as military men, they were interested. These are some of the things we expect to see more from our civilians, but the military seemed to have a very quick knack for getting on with the business. So I explained the sort of things we were going to do. And I, I did mention incidentally that I had actually written a paper on the subject. They asked me if I would go and retrieve it. I said, no, no, I can discuss, discuss it. So that was a very good impression on, on my mind about what uh, military administration could be able to perform once the leadership is sound and uh, ready and properly trained and disciplined and of course imbued with all the attributes for people who have come to change uh, those aspects of society. When he was a um, uh, military head of state or president, um, I didn't meet him officially, but I met him at home through his wife when we went to visit Her Excellency. Uh, his wife, Miriam, and um, he's somebody who interacts with people 
personally. Even those who worked with him, he works, you know, they are all like family. That is why you find that there is nobody who has worked with um, IBB that is still not with the, him, if that person is alive. Because that he has this magnetism, he has this charm, this charisma that, you, that is irresistible. And he goes out to make sure that, uh, you know, he keeps, he feeds that relationship. Baba Gita has a phenomenal, has a phenomenal memory. I mean, look, this is from a personal point of view. I met him first in 1980 when I was uh, doing national service in Mina. As a youth copper, I was living in the army officer's mess in the hill, in the, in the hill in uh, Mina. And most weekends, he would come in with his friends. You could see Babangida not just ask a soldier, uh, how are you doing? He will ask him, how is Grace? How is Dorothy? How is Michael? He remembers every soldier's child's name, everyone, wife, children, grandchildren, all. And it doesn't matter how many people are standing there, he'll remember all of them, except he never met them. There are not many soldiers like that. Who will take time to find out about the welfare of officers? Who will insist that they know what is happening to them? Uh, my understanding of the phenomenon of Ibrahim Badamesi Babangida, uh, known as IBB, uh, it's been many years now. And the Babangida that I have come to have in my memory, my image of him, was first captured my first year in um, secondary school. And we were asked to go and welcome the head of state to my home city in Ondo. And uh, so we were students and we went to welcome the head of state. And that was 1985. Somehow, it was supposed to be an impersonal thing. The head of state driving by this um, city and the children will wave at him and will wave the flag and that will be the end of the story. But somehow he managed to make it memorable because um, my uncle had died in 1966 in the military coup. Some It was um, GOC in Kaduna and about the first or second person killed in the coup of 1966. It was it's a very important thing in, in, among Ondo people. Uh, and we revive him, and everybody has that memory. And General Bamgida came out of his car when he saw the statue erected for Ademulegu at Ife Roundabout in Ondo. He came down and he went to the statue and gave his military salute. It, it was like, to my mind, like someone coming to my home to pay condolence. That's how I felt about it. So I, I, it didn't look to me anymore like a military head of state or a president just driving by. I felt like, okay, this is, uh, this is somebody. This is, as a child, I, I felt very happy. I admire him as a very young officer when I was also in service, when he became the military president in 1985. I mean, his leadership charm, his charisma, and his captivating smile was such that we were quite hopeful. Abibi is one Nigerian leader who massively transformed the Nigerian political tradition and altered the Nigerian political space. I will remember him mostly for MAMSA, an agency of government which was created to mobilize Nigerians. 
and Mamsa went to villages engaging Nigerians and preparing them for democracy. That impacted positively and redirected the thoughts of Nigerians. Babangida had unleashed the winning streak. Soon, the eyes of cynicism began to tow the human traffic pound across the bridge. Right from the first day, Babangida cut the new picture for himself and his administration. Only four months after Babangida took over and was still grappling with the winning confidence of Nigeria and the international community, the devil stepped out of the shadows. In early December 1985, a coup plot to overthrow him was discovered. If Babangida found this shocking, then even certainly found it even more shocking because it allegedly involved one of his childhood friends. For Babangida, he was really disappointed due to his close relationship with Maman Vata. He was my classmate. We went to the same school and a very, very close friend also when we were growing up. He joined us, he was in Abuja, mm -hmm. which is now Suleja. He joined us in 1959 in Bida. And in Bida, we became very, very close friends all the time. If Vatsa actually participated in the coup as alleged, a question arises as to why he would want to plot to overthrow his childhood friend. That question may never be satisfactorily answered, partly because Vata is no longer alive and partly because some of the stories about their alleged friction are exaggerated and rather too fanciful. Meanwhile, the story of Nigerian economy has been a tale of strange paradoxes. In the 70s and 80s, all the traditional economic indices pointed to a buoyant economy. An oil boom fueled Jangyati development project in the building and construction industry and other areas of economic activities. Still, in 1985, when Babangida came to power, the country could not boast of great and dynamic economy as it was beset with a very weak industrial and technological base. Helpless dependence on massive importation of machineries, spare parts and raw materials and poor infrastructural facilities such as power, water and roads. The Structural Adjustment Program SAP was Babangida's answer to the programs and the vagaries of the national economy, but the acronym SAP soon became the object of both variation and derision in the public. What we did was not IMF inspired because a lot of people in the media thought that even they will say we are not going to take the loan, we eventually went to take the loan. We had a look at it and maybe we have some of the best brains. Some of them I knew also worked for World Bank uh, international monetary fund. so they know everything they know what we, and we are there to know what we can take and what we may not be able to take and we have a Nigeria made um, project or program that I believe was going to be for the benefit of Nigeria and both the benefit of Nigerians so we told you all that and then began to come with a program uh, that you can reasonably assimilate and live with it and work harder so as to produce. The government is no longer in production, which is not easy. Uh, the ordinary farmer is not uh, gaining much as a result of his hard work because we have uh, a restriction yeah, government control all the time. So there is no incentive at all. So we said, no, open it. We opened the economy. We allowed all of you men who are ready to work hard. We Everything that you need, 
we provided it for you and let you go and use your brain and energy. That's the whole purpose of uh, And for every step we wanted to take, we also educated the people. And that also worked very, very well. I remember 1985-86 when we were struggling with the idea of taking a World Bank loan or undertaking the structural adjustment program. It was easy for a military president to say, look, cut the crap, we take the loan. But Babangida subjected it to a national discussion and debate. No soldier has done it before, no soldier has done it after. They take their decisions and take the consequences. But Babangida said, no, let us go to the people. I mean, my mother, a completely illiterate, she could neither read nor write. But she expressed her opinion on whether we should take a loan or not. And that opinion counted because at the end of the day, a majority of Nigerians said, look, we are owing already. Let us tighten our belts. Whether we were right or wrong is a matter of history. But whether Babagida did that democratic, did demonstrate the democratic credentials of a military man, I think he did. Suspicions remain strong that the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank had a hand in the program. The activists felt Esau's hairy hands, but heard Jacob's voice. The economists and experts who worked with the general were still convinced that the adoption of SAP was the most feasible economic route available for the country at the time. Structural adjustment for Nigeria means here we were, we were running short of foreign exchange. We have all these raw materials. We are running short of cash. How do we mobilize with labor and institutions to move Nigerian economy forward? By the time I put it this way, you can see why it was totally defeatist for us to be arguing about World Bank loan or IMF loan or any other financing because you needed money to implement that program. All you needed to be concerned with was the terms of the money. Some of them will come to you from uh, soft terms. Some international organizations will say, okay, we'll give you uh, grants that you don't have to pay back. That will address some of your key uh, health issues. Health issues are vaccinations, polio, and things of this sort. You get millions of dollars in grants, but these are not the millions you need for your industries or for your infrastructures. You move from those grants to, say, the, the World Bank, the ADB, that will give you long-term money with the requisite grace period and the, the, the framework within which to use it and begin to pay back. That may still not be enough. Then you can now go to, like the IMF, that will give you advice, but you have to argue before they will give you money. But the impression we created was that it's the IMF that was pushing to give us money. Of course, that was totally wrong. So part of the misunderstanding was we didn't see that the policy goes in first before you're now talking about giving this policy. What is the optimal financial package you put together to implement? And I had unexpected problems convincing my staff, convincing some of our university people, you know, they, they know the theory, but they not, they've not had enough practice to understand how, how these things work. Yes, indeed. The, 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 the program became necessary because when his government took over, Nigeria was owing a, an external debt of about $30 billion accumulated by the government that went before, especially the Shagari government, which issued, in my view, recklessly, uh, import licenses that brought in goods we could not pay for as a nation. So we, it, it, it took over into, into, a, into an economic crisis. And you have to find your way out of a crisis. And the first thing he did was to get uh, Chase Manhattan Bank of New York to help us to ascertain the size of the debt. And they were able to reject a lot of fraudulent transactions that were added to the debt stock. So that's the first thing they achieved, got rid of the false claims. And then 
we ascertained the debt came to about 20 billion, and then we attacked that subsequently. So, all in all, I, I, of course, I supported the program because it was the way forward for Nigeria at that time in those circumstances. Why the debate over the adoption of SAP was yet to abate, and with the dots still swelling around Babangida, a new dust storm circled around here. On October 19, 1986, Dele Giwa, editor-in-chief of Newswatch magazine, was about to have breakfast with the London bureau chief of the magazine, Kayode Shoinka, in his house on Talabi Street, Ikeja, Lagos. Received the parcel that bore the inscription from the office of CNC. As Giwa attempted to open what he thought was a letter from Babangida, the parcel blew up in his face. It killed him. The mother shocked and horrified the nation both by the novelty of the mother instrument and by its cruelty. It was the first profile killing of a Nigerian journalist in Nigeria. The nation was aghast. Babangida strongly denied the involvement of the military regime he led in the alleged crime. When I, it was pinpointed to the military, but I want you to know that uh, it's not just possible for military to pick up a rifle to go after one person or give a bomb after one person to kill it. And Nigeria's society is very fertile. Their minds are very fertile. They are very fast and they can work on things to say that this is what happened. And uh, virtually everybody had a share of blame in either. Uh, you, you can visualize and say, look, this is what happened. Who did it? That question dogged Babangida. The obligation of every person against or in respect of whom an order is made by a court of competent jurisdiction to obey it. Throughout his eight years in office, it still dogged him and may indeed do so for the rest of his life, as nothing has yet ended the suspicion that his regime was not blamed for it. Babangida did have quite a bit on his plate on the foreign policy front. He had no problem saying the right things in the right places. In his eight years in office, Babangida was a loud voice and a visible presence in virtually all the theaters of international politics. For a military commander-in-chief, he was and remains a very liberal person. And it's easy for you to be liberal uh, if you are persuasive, because you, are, you have the same amount of force and ability to use power like any other dictator. But you resort to it very rarely. You resort to it when you try out logic first. And for the most part, the that could use logic to get out of any difficult situation or to make an outcome to come to pass. So you would see that his liberalism uh, became both a blessing in the sense that whoever you talk to, whoever you interact with, if that person is negative towards the Bengida, it's chances are that that person has not had an opportunity to interact with him I, well, I was lecturing at uh, UNN at the time, and I was involved in the academic staff union of Nigeria universities at the time, that's all. And then we had an ongoing battle with the military. We wanted a situation where the academic uh, staff would get a better uh, condition of service. At that time, uh, the, the civil service had everybody were within the civil service. We had the academic staff union as just like any other staff, and they were paid the civil service salary and that didn't motivate these lecturers to be able to excel. So we thought it was necessary for us to engage government at the time. 
three things happened during that regime. First of all, we are removed from the academic, from the civil service salary structure uh, before Babangida's regime. When he came, he, he abrogated it and took us back to the civil service, but elongated the salary scale so that it was it was more, it was longer, better, and so on. But before he left in 1992, he restored an independent academic staff salary structure. And that is what has motivated the staff uh, in, the, in, in Nigerian universities to date. He also did a whole lot of institutional uh, strengthening. Uh, I think at that time we didn't have uh, so, so, so much of the, what they call at that time, the uh, Center for Democratic Studies. And then one of the things that were remarkable in his regime that there were many academicians, intellectuals were brought into government. So that divide between those in the governance structure and those in the, in the, in the academic pursuit were, was actually blood because what really happened was a whole lot of our colleagues were serving in government. First thing I will say, thanks be to Nigerians because a lot of people in this country who are Nigerians, are working in international organizations, making tremendous impact for the world. And we, I decided that we are going to make the best use of people of such uh, qualities to come and put their knowledge and skills for the benefit of Nigerians. If you are old enough to remember, we had a lot of ministers, uh, Kalu Yajikakalu, Chu Okongu, all these uh, people of international reputation. I tried, I reached out to people who knew them and tried to come back, to come and put their ideas into this. And willingly, like good Nigerians, they came. So I had a lot of extra advantage because of the use of quality people to steer this, uh, to make the relationship beneficial to Nigeria. I give you a good example. I had Professor Ransom Kuti. He works with the World Health Organization. So the person who was heading the organization then was Professor Ransom Kuti's colleague in the university in Europe and all that sort of thing. So to get him to help Nigeria is not an easy, it's not a difficult thing. You can take a phone and ring the man at uh, the World Health Organization to say, look, this is what I want for my country. And that worked very well. So I think we reached out to get people who will be of asset to the Nigerian but are not providing that uh, skill to Nigeria, reach out to them, get them back, come on. IBB phenomenon, you know, is one of the few military administrations that recognize the importance of intellectuals, right? If you look at his cabinet, you know, it's one of the highest intellectualized cabinets in the history of this country. At every point, what you have if it's the um, Minister of uh, uh, Health, is one of the best in the profession. You go to science, one of the best in the profession. You go to Ministry of Wars, one of the best in the uh, Attorney General was the, uh, the president of Nigerian Bar Association. He was picking the best profession, what, among the best. The Bangida was the first elected chairman of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, in 1987 and re-elected twice, an unprecedented expression of confidence in his leadership by the leaders of the community. He earned it by sheer energy and invested in the affairs of the organization. Under his leadership, ECOWAS went a radical step further to back up the mandatory mechanism with a military force known as Economic Community Monitoring Group, better known by its acronym, ECOMOG. It was the novelty in Africa. The ECOMOG succeeded in bringing about stability within that region because 
the instability was spreading. It is Liberia, it is Sierra Leone, and so on. Who knows, it could be Nigeria the next. So the fear of bringing about instability in the sub-region was what led to the formation of ECOBO. But it's not easy because you have 16 or 17 member country who have different background, different orientation. Four of us or five are British uh, Anglophone country. The majority are Francophone countries. So you have to apply a lot of skill to convince them, to work with them, to get involved in, in projects like this. And it is also a blessing for the first time in Africa and the world, you form up an organization that uh, will protect just member countries, will protect, uh, what do you call it, uh, economic community of West African state. The introduction of two-party system by the general received an enthusiastic welcome throughout the country and when it was put to test, first in the local government election of 1990 and later on June 12, 1993, the two-party system was a success. For the first time in the history of Nigeria, neither religion nor regionalism was a factor in how electorates voted. Very uh, decisive decision he took in the, to the fact that Nigeria needed just a two-party state, uh, two-party uh, government, and decided to to create two parties for Nigeria. Remember in those days it was said, little to the right, little to the left. And he put, pulled that idea through so that the NDP, Social Democratic Party, and NRC, National Republican Convention, were created. And the Nigerian politicians rallied around those two parties. And even went into elections on those platforms right up to presidential election, which ended up with the famous June 12th of uh, Abiola and the other guy from Kano. And which, again, he himself was a key, was head of state when the whole story of the annulment of that election took place. The past was better. It was a good decision. I still believe in this two-party system. In fact, you are right now, you are reaching that stage. 
There are two strong parties in the country today. APC, PDP. Now, time will come when, because they have stronger structures to run a country, some, PT, some people will just, or parties will just, the only thing, this is where INEC comes in, a party that has not had X number of, let's say, legislators, they don't qualify to continue to be run as a political party. And I knew if you adopt something like this, you will end up with this two-party system and the country will be better off. Unfortunately, the transition program hit the rock on June 23, 1993, following the annulment of the June 12 election. June 12 came to grieve and the country was in grief. But Bangida's elaborate and expensive transition program hit a coral reef. The annoyment shocked the country and the world. A poisonous combination of military intrigues and high wire politics brought the program to its knees. This, by the annulment of the June 12 election and its accompanied crisis, Babangida insisted that his team maintained the cordial relationship with late MKO Abiola's family. He was my friend, very close friend. Still see him as a friend because I relate with few members of his family. And uh, even during the crisis of June 12, we were still relating with Chief Amikeo Abiola. On the morning of August 27, 1993, President Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida signed Decree 61 into law. We were about to come up with um, a political program, which you Nigerians didn't like, all of you. You didn't like it. You, the phrase you used then was, you are tired and weary of uh, elections. But we knew that we have to run an election. The things we wanted to do for you to get a transition, you don't like it. So we set up a tr transition committee, a transition government, a contraption, you call it in Nigerian press. So we set up that contraption, quote and unquote, to run the country for a period of six months to usher in a new government. The Shonakon's government had a life. It has a period of six months to run as a government. But the Nigerians are not prepared to go through that system. And we are sensitive to the call by Nigerians. And you don't like it, you don't like it. The popular phrase then was, the worst military regime is better than this contraption. Don't forget, that is given an impetus to coup d'etat. Right. And after, if, if you had followed what we did in February of 1993, Shona Khan's government would have gone and an election would have been held so as to usher in a new government. But because you provided impetus to the military and to Abacha for that time, he swept aside the contraption sometimes in November of uh, 1993. And instead of staying for six months, Abacha stayed for five years. You called for it. When I say you, I mean the people. And I told you earlier that a coup d'etat only succeeds if the environment is conducive. So there is a frustration 
in the society there is a frustration abacha did not abacha's regime did not turn out to be the regime that you are looking for without stroke of the pen nigeria had a new government it was neither elected nor did it come to power through the barrier of gone it was a political contraption without precedent in the country later that morning babangida left asorok abuja for his hilltop villa niger state his eight years in power had ended babangida had since left the stream but his tail is still in the water those who want to dismiss him as an irrelevant quality in national politics have problems doing that june 12 has remained his albatross his cross he will carry it for the rest of his life june 12 is indeed a messy epitaph to the bangida's eight years rule fate does have a cruel sense of humor i am an advocate of the school of thought of democracy and june 12 and the annulment of um, June 12 by his uh, administration actually misrepresented his uh, uh, leadership personality. And that remains the grudge many Nigerians will have with him. I'm sure if one were still around, when June 12 occurred, uh, surely I would have advised against the annulment. I'm not saying it would have been accepted, but I would have advised against it, definitely. Because I never shied away from giving General Babangida advice that I consider to be honest and in the national interests of Nigeria. You know, it can be very lonely to be in, in office, in high office, very lonely. And there are many factors at play that unless you are close to the point of action, you will not know what is happening. Um, I don't know what forces combine to create the annulment. I've listened to various versions, uh, but I don't hold General Babangida responsible for whatever happened to me. So when, when the history is written about Nigeria and about the the, the involvement of the military in the political development of Nigeria, surely Babangida will feature for good or for evil. Those who like him will say he was a wonderful man. Those who don't like him will say he was, it, it was a bad news for Nigeria. And I imagine that is why he got the nickname Maradona, meaning skillful operator. Indeed, he's an amazing leader that he will have to live with the history of the June 12 saga. Here is the story of General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, an orphan who through selfless efforts and sheer discipline made it to the top of his profession. Here is the story of a man who did titanic things to create the Babangida era that would be the veritable watershed in the history of Nigeria. As he marks his 80th birthday on earth, virtually all his former colleagues, observers, as well as his friends and political associates speak well of him. Certainly, I wish him well. I'm happy for him. We thank God for his life. Uh, what else can I be as for from God? He made him a leader, he led this country for many years, and up to today, not only in Nigeria, in Africa, and indeed in the world uh, over, everybody knows uh, the history of IBB and what he has done for this country. I'm very, very happy for him, and I wish, you, I wish him many, many happier returns so that I also wish myself so that we can together continue seeing our children and grandchildren growing and take over uh, from
from us. I wish him well, continued good health and God's guidance. I wish him all the best. I wish him good health, robust health uh, from uh, and another thing I would wish him is to see Nigeria back to normalcy especially the insecurity problem we have. I wish IBB will sit down and be happy to hear that the problem in the Northeast, problem in Niger Delta, problem in Northwest, Southwest, the whole country we are at peace. And to see leadership that will galvanize the whole uh, population around the country, the way he wished yeah, when he was uh, the leader of this country, or even near to that, that is my wish for IBB. If he has that, I think the remaining years he will spend so peaceful. Well, I can only live long, so I, uh, if for me to wish him a long life, I think is an understatement. Uh, I, I wish him definitely wish him good health. Uh, 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 he's already prosperous, so if I say prosperity, just adding an icing on the cake. Um, uh, definitely uh, continue to serve Nigeria and Nigerians, and to make, uh, to make, to see in his lifetime Nigeria develop to be a role model of countries in Africa. I'm sure he. Will. He would be delighted to see the good work, his commitment, his contribution to Nigeria continues and, uh, and develops to a greater height. Uh, I don't think he would like to see his lifetime a broken Nigeria. Uh, he would like to see his lifetime a, a prosperous, united and indivisible Nigeria. So I wish him many, many, many happy returns in good health and prosperity. Well, we... From, for as long as I've known him, we've always called him old man. So he's, uh, he's just, we will probably now start calling him older man or something, but uh, we wish him best of health and uh, many more years ahead of service. Uh, and of course, we wish we hang around for much longer to see and uh, enjoy his great grandchildren, not just grandchildren. The, whatever he did and didn't do, I think it's what was within their system of uh, of uh, rules and then and then and then being able to govern. There are two things that we must have to separate from him: him as a person, not his uh, the military, and not the governance at, at that time. Him as a person is totally a different picture from being able to stay in an institutional setting, because the military is a complex uh, uh, setup. Well. Um... Mr. President, my father lived to be 110, but he wasn't the head of state, so he didn't carry all the burden of the head of state. I wish you live that long. To enjoy the friendship you have created, to enjoy the families you have helped to build, and also to give you time to reminisce on the things you have done. May I be wrong, may I be right. But I wish you well, and I wish you a very, very happy birthday. Babangida can level to somebody, even a driver. He can level with someone that is highly educated. So whatever makes a human being, it's in that man. And um, there are a few things I, I copied from him. Let me just quote him. You start to see obstacles when you remove your eyes from your goal. So I'm going to leave that to every Nigerian. He should continue to smile so that we can see the gap to it and know that God is good. I am humbled and privileged to say a word or two on the occasion of the 80th birthday of who I call a big boss, General and President IBB, Ibrahim Babangida. I will wish him a happy birthday and I will wish that he has many, many more years 
on earth to guide us in this country. And finally, may God grant him all his heart desires. I wish him long life and I wish him a healthy life. I wish he will have, his health will improve greatly, significantly. He should bounce back. I want to wish him good health, wisdom, uh, for him to continue the good work he has been doing to people. Uh, at 80, he has seen everything. He was everything. So I wish him a very long life, very healthy life, and uh, prosperous too, life. So he had made his own contribution to the nation better than to their own. And only that way we can build a prosperous, a united, and peace, a peaceful uh, Nigeria. We want to congratulate him for his 80 years. I wish him a longer life, a prosperous living, a good health. I wish one day he will come back to Goma College again to see the good things his old school is doing. Yeah, I wish him continuous uh, Allah's guidance, and, uh, good health, you know, because I'm sure at that age, you know, one cannot run away from one element or the other. Yeah, but uh, we're faith in Almighty Allah, which I'm sure he believes strongly in. You know, uh, we we'll continue to pray for his good health. IBB at 80 is a leader who came, who saw, and conquered. He remained a reservoir of wisdom for the young ones to explain. Well, I wish him what I wish myself. I'll be 83 in September. As you can see, I'm still very much around. I thank God I'm still physically and mentally awake. I still go to my farm three times a week. So I wish him excellent health, improved health, and uh, joy in his life. You know, in old age, the things that matter to you most are no longer the material things. In fact, your capacity to enjoy anything is diminishing every day. So what you really need first is peace, peace of mind. Then join your heart, in your family, good health, and God's grace. So I wish him all of those things. Uh, I think he deserves them. But for June 12th, Ibrahim uh, Rangida will have been acclaimed as the father of modern Nigeria because he tried to rebuild Nigeria. The cabinet he appointed, not because I was part of it, was a very qualitative cabinet. Um, the programs he espoused were very fundamental programs, like uh, trying to give a new political system to Nigeria, uh, trying to create permanent uh, offices for political parties. And most of all, he Everybody felt at home in this government. I repeat that. Every one of us felt at home in General Babangida's government. It was not so before him. It has not been so since he left. That makes all the difference between his time and the present time. He was reputedly the only man who knew where he would be over a given period of time and had all he needed to succeed and become the permanent giant on the nation's political stage. The history of Nigeria will never be complete unless the name of a phenomenon known as General Ibrahim Babangida is mentioned.